platser här framme om någon vill uh, sitta ner. Uh, and now I will switch to English. I don't know whether there's anyone here today who does not speak Swedish. Is there? Yes. Welcome. No, that's great. Uh, I, were going to, I, I would be speaking. The next two things will happen in English regardless because, uh, because the, um, well, for two reasons. One of the re reasons is totally real and it's that I don't know any of these words in Swedish. Um, the other reason is that our audience, we know that, that a lot of these films that we make from these uh, talks and panels uh, are watched internationally, as, uh, just as the report is read internationally. Um, yeah, now I'll take it Den här datorn får ni gärna ta, ta ifrån mig. Um, and um, so we are speaking not just to Western Sweden and the wider uh, Swedish industry today, but of course we're speaking as well to uh, the world. That was a surprising development, I should say, when we started this project six years ago. I don't think we expected uh, to be read with such care at all the European film institutes and and. Uh, at the film markets all over the world, where we travel uh, to present our work. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased, of course, that that has been the effect. I'm going to talk to you today uh, on a sort of broader level about some of the underlying themes of this year's report. Uh, what always happens at Westernske Filmdag and our the audiovisual days is that we're all just starting work on next year's report, so actually a lot of the thinking has been recontextualized. So if you heard this talk in January, I'm going to show you almost exactly the same slides, but I'm going to be saying relatively different things because a lot of things has happened uh, during this year. We always have to do this little reminder because it's very difficult for f film industry people to remember the word Nostradamus. It's not the Nosferatu report. It is not the Nostromo report, even though I understand that this Nostromo is the uh, spaceship in Alien. Uh, yes, I mean, a lot of these, uh, these changes that we talk about are very terrifying, but they are not monstrous in that sense. Um, Nostradamus was a 16th century uh, doctor and occultist. He claimed to see the future, I believe. Uh, perhaps he used too many psychedelics. Uh, when we look into the future, we don't do that with mushrooms. Uh, we do that with funding from these good places. Uh, and what we do basically is that we read the industry papers, we read those reports that you always get newsletters about, but you don't have time to look at. We talk to a lot of people in a lot of bars at film festivals and a lot of cafe mingel at, uh, at, at seminars like this. We listen to a lot of talks and then we interview a number of people uh, who are in strategic positions about the industry, about what they're doing today. And as we know, the cycles in particular of feature film production are so long that when the people who are thinking ahead are working on something today, that will in fact be real. They, will, they are building today, as many of you are, the, the things you're doing at your office today are shaping the reality of the screen industries three to five years from now when the project you're just gestating now will be released. So we're actually pretty good at predicting the future because we're not predicting the future, we're describing what is happening right now. Um, and it's a sort of general human problem that our understanding often uh, isn't quite caught up with what we're actually already doing. So I would say that Nostradamus, you can think of it as a lens where we're helping all of you see in another perspective what you're already doing. Uh, I'm pretty sure you've all seen this film. It's called The Ten Meter Tower. It's a Swedish short from 2016, Hopp Tornet. Um, the whole concept of this film is that people are trying to, to jump from the 10-meter tower in a, in a swimming um, hall. Um, it did pretty well on the short uh, documentary circuit. Uh, later, it became a viral sensation. Uh, it was selected by the New York Times for their Op Docs uh, series uh, and, and released on their webpage and, and reached a massive international audience uh, that way. And this film, of course, this therefore is a practical example about how everything about film distribution and circulation is changing. It's a good reminder that short film, which, uh, let's face it, perhaps we have all, we, we, all, we all always pretended to really love short film, but of course we have all as an industry, we often have talked, like what we actually think about short film is that it's a training ground to make real movies. Um, but the, I think that is changing. Uh, I think we all understand that, that the status and, and uh, reach of short film uh, is also um, becoming much higher today because it fits uh, the new platform so well. 
but this image and this film is also an illustration of the core finding of this year's report. So we're standing at an edge. All of these changes that we've been monitoring for five years are, are coming to a head right now. And Klaus Lallagård, who's the CEO of the Danish Film Institute, uh, and uh, in a very Danish fashion, a very, un, a very fearless uh, speaker, he verbalized very succinctly something that I would say everybody that we were speaking uh, to in this report and, and during the year were saying the same thing in different ways. But he really like boiled it down and said specifically about the feature film industry. Somehow it really thrills me that we can win or we can fail. We can lose it all within the next two, four, six years. But I also think that we can win and emerge as a film industry better and with more impact. So lose it all, that doesn't sound uh, very good. Like, what does it mean? Like, what are we talking about when we're saying that we can lose it all within five years? And I'm going to, to tell you, have to tell you this uh, by talking about something else. And I know this is hard because when you're at the heart of something, like all of you are at the heart in some manner of the film industry, if you're working with this every day, it's very, very difficult to see it in a wider perspective. And that's why I need to talk about another art form first. Has any of you ever had a profound cultural experience uh, watching an opera, perhaps, or a play in a theater? Yes, okay. So have I, many times. So we can all agree that the medium of stage, uh, live stage performances of fictional stories has an enormous power. It has an enormously important artistic potential, democratic potential, human potential. I think we can also all agree that we don't go to the theater every month. month. Most of us don't go to the theater four times a year. Um, the most momentous piece of media news for me from the previous year, which would be 2017, was this. This is the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Uh, it's an American big top circus, uh, which uh, is very well known, probably the most famous circus in the world for a very long time. In the Nordic countries, of course, we mostly saw them uh, in television um, uh, programs in the, in the 80s and 90s. After 146 consecutive years of performance and touring, the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus closed. They gave their final performance in May 2017. Now, this does not mean that the circus as an art form is dead. So you could argue that artistically, circus is doing better than it ever has. But it's also very clear that just like the cultural role of opera has changed in the last 400 years, the cultural role of the circus has changed in the last 200 years. So this image is from Cirque du Soleil on Broadway, and you can go and see them, and it's amazing, it's very, very good. And the people who go will pay $150 for a ticket without blinking. So this is a, an artistically outstanding and financially very profitable art form. But that does not change the fact that Big Top Circus, as a broad public entertainment category, is very rapidly becoming a thing of the past. And that is the kind of change that I'm talking about when we're looking at what is potentially happening with film right now. Um, and I think perhaps that, that, that when we're talking about it on this level, of course, that's not going to happen within five years. But depending on how we all act in the next five years, the kinds of choices that we as an industry make, we might be talking about something like this on a 20-year scale. So, Opera is still around, just like circus is still around. And opera, one of the reasons that opera is still around is that we're using public money to protect the formus, uh, format and the status of opera. And I'm a classically trained singer. I think that's a very good investment. I think we should do that. And I'm, of course, I mean, I love arts funding, assuming that the, that the populists don't take over all of Europe and we continue having arts funding. We could do exactly the same thing with film. We can turn film into a museal art form which is vivid and interesting and relatively marginal, just like opera is today. We, what we cannot do with public money is we cannot force an art form to stay relevant to a broad audience. Now, I don't see, and neither do the experts that we talk to, thank God, that we should now roll over and say, OK, it's done. We have lost. It will never be the same. Young people are just not interested. We can't ever reach. And the funny thing is, the more I think about it, this, the more I've been thinking about it this year, is that I hear these kinds of things all the time. I hear people in the film industry all the time saying, well, you know, we can't, young people are just not interested in X, or, well, we can't ever reach, or it's never going to be the same as it was in the 1940s or the 1980s, or, or whenever you 
think that the golden age of cinema was. Usually it's at the time in your personal career when you were making the most money. Um, now, yes, no opera is obviously never going to be the same as in 1776. Uh, and film is never going to be the same as in the 1940s. The whole context has changed. Obviously, obviously that's the case. But this kind of language is very insidious because when you hear people saying these kinds of things, it means that, it means that they have already given up. And if the people who are in charge of film policy, or if your bosses, or if the people who are talking about strategy at your, at your production company are using this kind of language, they're probably not solving the right problem. Uh, film has had a very good run for over 120 years, but it would be criminally naive to assume that the rules of cultural change would not apply to us, that we are somehow different from every other kind of art form. And in the last five years, we have seen a change in viewing behaviors that will never be rolled back. Everything about this industry has already changed. Uh, the movie theaters are doing well, but the role and function is changing. We are already seeing a very sort of rapid um, polarization between two kinds of very different kinds of movie theaters. One are these bombastic palaces of experience where you go and see big loud movies and then you have places of social meeting and curation and both of these have a function both of these are financially very important to the industry uh, and both of these can be very very good they can uh, display very good excellent content and film as a medium uh, even feature film is doing very well even though there is better and more TV drama content than ever before uh, in the history of television. People still watch feature-length content uh, as much as they did before. And of course, if we calculate watching two or three episodes of the same TV show as feature-length content, I would say that most consumers of audiovisual media do this almost every day. People still love film, people clearly love cinematic storytelling, people love stories that end. Because sometimes, you know, when a new TV show starts, I can't even engage. Like, it's like starting to read Marcel Proust, I don't have time for that, I don't know how long this is going to take, so I'm just waiting for it to end so that I can judge my commitment. Uh, a movie is so much nicer in that way. Um, we love going to the cinema, even teenagers, uh, according to excellent research from Coca-Cola, who of course are a very big player in the uh, cinema marketplace, um, uh, they're in their uh, research, teen audiences particularly mention that they love the experience of watching things on the big screen, the immersion and the not being on your phone that is happening in that space. Then teenagers don't love the rest of the cinema experience, what's happening before and what's happening after, and the, that you're always kicked out next to some kind of trash can in a back alley, all of that, that stuff. But there's nothing about the... So clearly there are some platform problems with the cinema, but the experience of watching a movie is still very strong. Now, we still have tent poles. Uh, the top 20, 30 blockbuster uh, titles, as we know, gather enormous audiences. And a lot of that is through this sort of wow effect storytelling that belongs in the, the multiplex environment. Uh, these films keep the exhibitors in business. Uh, and as we have seen many times, for instance, with Black Panther this year, commercial success is not in any way in conflict with being a very important movie politically or artistically in its genre. Now, this is... Uh, I think I showed this number already last year, uh, this diagram, but I'm going to show it again. If you're interested in film, uh, the film industry, you should follow a man called Stephen Follows. His website is stephenfollows.com and it's free and he has a very good newsletter. He's a statistics nerd. Um, so this is, uh, these are numbers from him. Uh, using the year 2000 as a baseline and going over these go to 2016, but the trend is still the same. The blue line is cinema admissions, in this case in the United States uh, and the UK, and the rest of Europe looks quite a lot like the UK numbers do here at the right. Uh, US cinema admissions have gone down a little bit, they've corrected a little bit this year, but it's basically the same. Uh, and in, the U in, the, in Europe, the, the admissions are basically level, it's the same. But the orange line is the number of titles that we release in the cinemas. Now, anybody can see that if not more, more people are not going to the movie theaters, but we're releasing that many more films, then clearly we're not going to have the same kinds of audiences for every individual title. It's just a mathematical impossibility. And we know we have a very good study from Norway last year, or this year actually, uh, looking at the impact of the digitalization of cinemas, and just as expected, um, the biggest films take a slightly larger share than they did before, because the big premieres uh, end up also in the small towns at the same time, so everybody goes to see those. And then there is a kind of long tail. More titles are seen by people than before, but each individual title, is, if, unless it's a big blockbuster film, is seen by quite a few people. So all of us who are relying on a business model, where we're going to make most of our money in the, in the theatrical window, are clearly in trouble. 
uh, if this development meant that every viewer can select and watch films that are meaningful for them, this would actually be great, but this doesn't seem to be the case. We know that very many good films don't find an audience at all. Plenty of viewers are choosing other media because they can't identify the, til the films that are relevant to them. So I can't, I don't know, and I mean, I'm in this industry and I don't know which movies I'm supposed to be watching right now, which, which ones are for me, unless it's a superhero movie, in which case I know, and then in the end I'm going to default to that quite often. And we have the same problem in a lot of markets. And in Europe, when you're looking at the big film production uh, countries like Spain and France, they are releasing so many films that sometimes that it averages out to, to approximately four domestic premieres every week. You realize what would, I mean, even in Sweden already, I think we are cannibalizing each other's audiences. We're making too many movies, it's very clear. Or at least we're putting too many of the movies that we're making into the cinemas. The audiences can't handle it and individual titles don't get to be there long enough to build an audience. So this is a, a structural problem. And this has made me think, and I'm going to return to this, that this is a problem in some ways that we have brought upon ourselves. When, what, what do we mean when we're saying that we're making too, too many movies? Because now every individual producer is going, yes, but my movies should still be made. Yes, I, I get it, yes, of course. But on the structural level, the fact that we have so much more money in the system now, basically a lot of this growth comes from production incentives across Europe. More money has entered the ecosystem and it's not helping us, I think it's hurting us. At the same time, of course, television, because of the, uh, the, the growth of new platforms, uh, television is, is uh, growing. Similarly, the, the numbers, the, the US numbers always come from uh, the FX Networks Research Department, and these are the latest ones, and every year they say, we think in two years it's going to, uh, the, the, we, will, we, will, we will have reached peak television, and every year they push it another year ahead. So we don't know, but I think we're at least four or five years, would be my guess, from at the number of original scripted series, which is what we're seeing here, turning down. Video streaming uh, is accelerating. It, you know, we're going to roll out 5G, uh, which means that a lot of Americans who didn't have very good internet before are going to be able to watch video on their cell phones. And I think that will grow the market for more video services. Um, and, and therefore, I think the SVOD uh, industries will still be growing. And the best of these shows are, co are of course, competing with our audiences, uh, also with the film, because we're, most of them, those in the end were watching on the same screens. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to talk a lot about gaming, but, but it, the most important thing to, to, to remember is that we're doing a lot of other things on the exact same screens as well. Now, the majority of films are viewed in the home, and that's been true since the VHS was introduced, right? The VCR uh, was introduced. Um, but, that's, but that also means, in a very practical sense, that that every piece of content that we make isn't just in competition with film and television, which is what we as an industry are very good at thinking about. It even says film Octave right there. But we have to remember that, that the, the landscape that we're in, the actual uh, consumption landscape, includes every other kind of audiovisual content that is used on the same screen. It's also Facebook, and it's also my work email, and it's also um, eSports, and it's also traditional sports, and it's also idols, and it's also, you know, uh, the great British Bake Off, <coughs> and, and uh, it's also gaming, of course, which uh, is bigger than uh, the digital gaming is bigger, has been for a very long time, for a decade almost, much, much bigger in revenue, uh, and I, I, it starts to look like in time as well, uh, time spent, uh, than the global um, movie industry. So the younger audiences, uh, I, I think I'm generally saying that there's very good statistics about what young people are actually doing with their media use. And I would recommend everybody to go and look at those that are relevant to their own countries. Um, because weirdly, the, the change that for us is a rapid change that has taken five years. If you're 25 years old or younger, that's just the way the universe is. They don't even know what it used to be like before. So quite often when we're trying to place a piece of content in front, in front of a young viewer, they don't, they're never going to see it anywhere because they're just not on those platforms. Broadcast is uh, basically entirely irrelevant to younger audiences. And, and you have to remember that a 14-year-old today is a 19-year-old tomorrow. A 20-year-old today is a 25-year-old uh, uh, five years from now. And these people live very different lives in media consumption-wise than we do. And this is, of course, a distribution problem. Uh, it's also a sales problem because we have very clear numbers that suggest that younger, uh, this, this generation does not respond to advertising. You can't show them ads 
that's not going to have an impact. They see through that. It doesn't work at all. They are interested in recommendations. Uh, people that they trust having seen things, the most valuable way of communicating with the young viewer is for a, an actual real world friend telling them to go see something. Influencers are the second best thing. And this data is very compelling. But this is not just a sales problem. This is a life and death artistic question. Because if you look at a teenager and you have no idea what's going on in their lives, you can't make a piece of content that is meaningful to them. I think it's, it's startling how many family movies and youth movies are set in my youth. You know, still, of course, I want to make films about things, about what it was like to be young when I was young. But I'm not sure that the relevance of that is very high to someone who is 14 years uh, old today. Uh, now, of course, it's still a, a legal requirement in the Nordic countries that you have to have a picture of scum when you're talking about the industry. Mine is here. Um, so, so there is, we know that we know because of this example that it's possible to solve this conundrum. Um, the public broadcasting company in Norway did not roll over. Uh, they, ha they have a very cl clear vision. Uh, they know that the audience is, is on the small screens and they know that they could put uh, content in front of them. Uh, and of course, there's a whole thing about this being long term work, and they have worked uh, connected for about 10 years making transmedial content for young, in particular, young female viewers in Norway. So they've trained them as well to, to trust their brand. Uh, but the important thing to think about about Scum is that it's not one hit, it was four entirely different hits. It was a hit uh, on their online blog release format, it was a hit in their catch up player, it was a hit in broadcast, and it was a hit internationally on the piracy platforms. And those are very different behaviors. But ultimately, of course, the reason this show succeeded was that its target audience was very specific. 16-year-old Norwegian girls. That's the only people they were trying to reach. And they did all the research and made content that is optimally relevant for 16 year not 16 to 24, not, none of that stuff, just specifically. They just wanted to reach the 16-year-old females in Norway. And through making content that was uh, supremely compelling to that audience and completely plausible and, and believable to them, they created something that my mother became obsessed with in Finland and gay men in the, their 40s became obsessed with in the United States and so on. And I think there's a clue here. And these success stories are important because they demonstrate that we don't have to lose the whole generation of viewers. Um, but it also reminds us about the ecosystem uh, of, of, of every kind of audiovisual storytelling. Film is programmed less and less uh, on, on broadcast television. We've lost the DVD window and, you know, let's never talk about that again. That's a given. Uh, but I think that, that that means that, relatively speaking, the broadcast money is now more important than it was before. And, and it's, there's reason to assume that that might be going as well. Uh, it, the numbers are impressive from a filmmaker's perspective, but from the broadcaster's perspective, numbers for feature film, for instance, are quite bad. And even in countries like France, where it's legislated that the broadcasters have to invest in, in film production, the money is lower because it's uh, defined as a percentage of the revenue and the revenue for television is going down. So we have to remember th all the time that the, every change at any point in this ecosystem, on the European level, on the local level, on the regional level, is going to affect also something that seems to be disconnected. You cannot separate film and television from each other because they are in the same food chain when it comes to, to money, how the money flows and how the audience attention is directed. And at the same time, many laws of film and television are, are changing. And I, I, I wonder increasingly, if we look something at Big Little Lies, um, which was about two and a half feature films in length, is this film or is this television? You look at the talent and you look at the way it's story, it's told, the story is told and the way it was consumed. A lot of viewers watched it uh, just over two nights. I'm not sure anymore that it's meaningful to talk about the distinction. In fact, I think increasingly that we should stop thinking about this as two different categories. And this, of course, has consequences because most funding bodies cannot think laterally in this way. Boris Kilmoteve found big uh, exception, good work. Um, Yes. We are increasingly seeing feature films that are not intended to see it be seen in cinemas, like those that Netflix produces. Uh, or that, but I mean, I think it's also we have to accept that most of the films that we make 
will not be able to have a theatrical release because there is literally no more space in the theaters. We cannot put more films there. Or if we do, they're not going to reach an audience again because they're there for too short a time. So, so I think it's very clear that even in just the Swedish market, if you make long, more longer films, we're going to have to release them some other way than in the cinemas. And then you're thinking, <gasps> but then I'm not going to make any money. Well, yeah, but you're also not making any money right now. Let's face it, like a lot of those films in the cinema are not making any money. So we need to figure out to be crass, which of those films are, don't have a chance in the cinema and just don't put them there. But then the money has to come from somewhere else. You have to figure out who is this content for, where is their attention, how do I monetize it, and work backwards to build completely different kinds of, of funding structures for them. And I realize public funding, again, is not ahead of the curve on this. Um, we're seeing, just, just now it was announced uh, this week that Netflix are, are re is uh, producing, for instance, new films this year with Alfonso Cuaron and Paul Greengrass, and they're going to release them day and date, trivially small, about 100 different cinemas around the world, and then at the Netf on Netflix at the same time. But we're seeing that the, the rules about what's happening are, is changing. Uh, is it Landmark Cinemas that is for sale in the United States, the big uh, cinema chain? It could be bought by one of the Espot services. That's a completely feasible way, or it could be bought by Disney, who, by the way, are also releasing their own digital service next year. And all of the rules of where it makes sense for the, the big players to release their content might be changed, or is very rapidly changing. And that's going to affect audience expectations, and it's going to open a space right now where I think all of us can start to think in quite creative ways about what is a reasonable release for exactly the kind of, of content you're making. And at the same time, uh, there's, uh, there's this Facebook release, the device this year called Portal, which is a kind of camera that is intended for video chat. So the, the video call function in Messenger, if instead of a phone you would want a video call device, they're thinking that you should use Portal. Now this week we found out that they have a product uh, called Ripley. They haven't announced it, but you can, it's been identified in different ways. And that's a, that's a camera that you put on top of your television, which is just so that you can have video chat from your living room. But once you have a Facebook device that speaks to your television, of course, it's also supposedly to be enabled. It's becoming a kind of addition so that you can f streaming Facebook video to your television screen becomes much, much easier. So there is there, I think the theory is that you're supposed to get this device because you want the video calling service. But once it's there, A, you have a camera aimed at your living room where Facebook is watching you watch other people's content. <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that, but whatever. Um, and also, secondly, uh, you're connecting your Facebook account directly to the television, of course, lowering the threshold to watch video content there. I also heard a, a lecture literally yesterday for, with Spotify, where for a guy from Spotify, where he said, yeah, no, we're looking, of course, we're looking at becoming a media company. They're already commissioning original content. I think Spotify is one of the Nordic players that is looking very um, seriously at becoming a global challenger to, to these kinds of, of, of tech uh, media hybrid companies. Um, Yes. So everybody that we're talking to says, yes, of course, the European digital single market is currently protecting the territoriality, uh, territorial sales, but everybody also agrees that in the long term this isn't feasible. Uh, this is going to change. Releases work differently, the technologies work differently, the consumers don't understand it at all. The attention of global audiences is going to be monetized in different ways but it's probably not going to be along the nation state borders. That seems uh, like a very old fashioned way of doing it. And we don't know exactly what the consequences are, but we certainly see already in preparation for this vertical consolidation when it comes to, to both the production uh, and, and sales and distribution, everybody is trying to climb up the chain or down the chain to own more of the IP or to own the audience relationship because ultimately that's where the money is going to be and m bigger companies are needed and new kinds of middlemen will be needed in this environment. And this is probably going to happen very rapidly. And this is a serious problem again. So if you're, if you're thinking, I guess to cap, recap what I've said so far, if you're still thinking that five years from now you're going to be making content, releasing it in cinemas, obviously for every movie that you make, you're going to be making money in the theatrical window and through, through for instance, territorial pre-sales. I, I think you're going to have to think again. And I, I, I know it sounds terrible, but I, I do think that genuinely there are going to be other, other kinds of cash flow. So this isn't going to be a massive problem, 
but there's going to be a, a bit that's going to be quite scary when we have to take the chances and see which things work, and some of them are not going to work. But what is very clear is that for a lot of types of film, especially sort of the middle and smaller titles, the old system is not going to work anymore. That's already gone. Yes. Um, we, of course, also had that, uh, the decision now that the streaming services are going to have to, to have 30% European content and a lot of uh, areas in Europe are going to force them to do it through local investment. I'm not uh, an enormous fan of this kind of legislation. I think it reeks of magical thinking. Um, but this decision is made and it's going to bring probably some additional cash into the industry in Europe. But again, I'm not sure what we need is more cash. <laughs> Like, because obviously what's going to happen is we're just going to be producing more things. And we're going to, and all, each of those things is going to connect to fewer viewers. Like, we, we're, I think we're working on, this, on the wrong problem. If your problem, if the problem you're working on is how can we get more money to make more things, instead of who is the audience for this thing and how can I connect with that audience, then, then I think fundamentally uh, you're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, finally, I'd like to say uh, in this last section some things about how we think about who, who, who the enemy is here. And from a European perspective, we've always thought about the Hollywood majors in particular as sort of godlike, who are these giants, they can fund and make and attract European audiences with masterful cinema and also really good looking trash. Uh, and both of those do very well and it's really crazy. And then, of course, and the, I know this picture is already completely old because Fox is gone and so on. Um, uh, similarly, and of, and of course also because all the, most of the majors, or indeed I think all of the majors, are now also owned by, by telcos or in, in the same um, complexes uh, with uh, concerns with, with telcos. Uh, so, so it's, but even on their own, they're very big players, right? And then uh, Netflix, of course, came. Uh, um, and became like an additional, in a way, like a major threat in that way. We talk of Netflix as a mythical monster. It eats the viewers. It lures them into this endless labyrinth, and it does it through cheating, the cheating method of sneakily using relevant content of excellent quality. And that's clearly unfair. They shouldn't be doing that. And then we whine about how evil they are, and then we go home in the evenings and watch Netflix ourselves. The US SVOD services alone are estimated to spend 20 billion US dollars on content this year. That's up from 15 billion dollars next year, and the prognosis is that that number will be bigger in 2019. And if we just look at the Hollywood majors, that is also pretty big. The, if you list the top 50 global audiovisual companies in any category, 37% of their revenues are represented by the companies on that bottom line right there. The, this is big, like they, they were big. Maybe we were right to be, to be worried about them. But I think what we need to understand is that as big as they were, that's now the least of our problems, right? So, um, yeah, this is Disney's... Um, this is a relatively recent screen cap of the top seven, in this case, films in the in US box office. Uh, the important thing to notice here is Black Panther, Disney, Avengers, Disney, Incredibles 2, Disney, Jurassic World, not Disney, Deadpool 2, Fox, which is Di Marvel and therefore and also Fox and therefore Disney, Ant-Man, Disney, and Solo, Disney. And you all know that Solo, a Star Wars story, was considered to be a flop, right? We were all saying, like, <laughs> that flopped. <laughs> Disney is so fucked with Star Wars. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It clearly did very bad, very bad. Clearly Disney is in trouble. Um, in, 20, uh, in 2016, when industry overall earnings shrank 19%, Disney took home 61% of the money actually made. And next year, I'm pretty sure, like this year, as we can see, their numbers are going to be crazier. Next year, when they, when they launch their uh, own SVOD service and they will own the whole pipeline uh, into the audience's eyes, uh, I think it's going to be a complete game changer. And it's worth thinking because Disney is becoming... Uh, I, just, I know Disney is one of the majors and I'm going to talk about the, the next problem, but I think Disney is becoming one of the next problem players. Their business model isn't selling you know, a film, I don't think. Disney's business model is to, to own worlds that are like secular myths, that are the kinds of stories that people like me will want to give to their children, whether it's Spider-Man or Mickey Mouse or, or Star Wars, the idea of, of owning dreams and families and your children's imaginations and therefore also their backpacks and their lunchboxes and their t-shirts and their pajamas and so on. Uh, and they make it through the production of this in incredibly high quality content, like unquestionably very good storytelling. Um, but they have a hundred year plan. And I think like, 
a lot of companies in the world, like a lot, including a lot of uh, you know companies that we work with, we don't even have a two-year plan. But but it's very difficult when somebody with Disney's muscles are thinking long term about what they're trying to do and be in the world. Um, you know, they're they're going to basically own. They already basically own the box office. Like they they are probably when it comes to to feature film cinema, they are the most like they're they're the giant, and everybody else uh, is is tiny. And if you release like a one-shot Norwegian standalone drama film, you're in competition with these kinds of narrative brands that humans are literally tattooing on their bodies. Even so, we have a bigger problem now. Okay. So, <laughs> these would be the top 10 uh, companies by market capitalization uh, in any category in the world. Any kind of company in the world, top 10 measured in market cap. We can talk later about what that means, but that is a reasonable measure for how big a company is. Um, out of these top 10 players, Apple, Alphabet, which includes Google and therefore YouTube, Microsoft, which includes Xbox, Amazon and Facebook are five of the top eight biggest companies in any world in the world in any category by market cap. Okay. And and these companies are becoming like hundred billion dollar companies. They're just somewhere where, where they are. Uh, Netflix was expected to go down this week, but they just relieved, uh, uh, released their Q3 earnings and they're looking fine. So investors believe in them still. Uh, any of these companies, uh, the FANG companies um, and Microsoft can, could decide tomorrow to acquire a major studio. They could do it like this. They have the cash. Uh, Netflix doesn't, but everybody else uh, has actual uh, money. And just to give you an idea of the kind of scales we're dealing with here, the App Store, which you buy your apps at if you're an iPhone user, it opened 10 years ago. This year, 2018, it is protect projected, only the App Store on its own, is projected to surpass the global movie industry in revenue. Facebook and Google between them account for 61% of all the online advertising revenue in the world, which apparently translates to about a quarter of all the advertising revenue in the world, just those two companies. And it's just, they have this money in piles just waiting to be spent, like they cannot spend it fast enough. Uh, the founder of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, his, according to Wikipedia, his personal net worth is 160 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, Disney bought the Fox assets for 71.4 billion dollars. So this means that Jeff Bezos personally could have bought the Fox assets twice. Not Amazon, just, just him individually. And these, content, these companies who are all in the content business now, they sell other things than content. Much like Disney, their business model is no longer to sell the film, and therefore they cannot be outspent. And if you look very carefully at this list, you will see here names like Alibaba and Tencent that are also in the top, um, top eight. Uh, and already if you read the trade papers, you see those, those, um, these Chinese companies mentioned more and more often when it comes to film production. I think in two years, we're going to talk about them in the same way that we're talking about Facebook uh, and Amazon today. The profitability of a single piece of content is entirely irrelevant to these companies because they are using the content to sell something else entirely. iPhones, gaming systems, book, books, groceries. If you, Amazon now has the Tolkien rights, so if you want to see the Silmarillion television show, you're going to have to become an Amazon Prime member, so of course you will, and when you do, in most American uh, big urban areas, you can have your Whole Foods groceries delivered for free within two hours to your home. That's a very different kind of offer than via play, let's say. <laughs> and most people who make content in the Nordic countries, we still me need each of these to be individually profitable. And these companies don't. So they can, we can never outspend them. We can never outspend them. But the good news is that we could never outspend the Hollywood majors either. Like we could never compete with them on money. But we had this weird idea that somehow we're going to have to. No, I, I like we, we should just drop that. Like we should let that go. And possibly it's now the power dynamics might be so, such that the Hollywood majors are actually on the same team as us, which is people who are like fighting back against these giants. But I think this is fine because again, like more money is probably not the answers. We have added a lot of money into the, into the ecosystem in the Nordic countries and in Europe in the last 10 years. And we're clearly not spending it right. We haven't solved our problems with that money. So I think we're fine. Okay. Uh, 
so where are we? What have we talked about? Uh, things that have changed already or are is rapidly changing. Window systems, territorial sales, viewing habits, theatrical real estate, funding structures, broadcast television investment, advertising. Uh, print and broadcast media, obviously we don't have film reviews anymore, that's pretty big. Cultural relevance of formats, cultural re relevance of platforms, cultural relevance of cinema. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Windows platforms, territories and formats are converging. Audiovisual works are used to sell many other things than the work itself. The cultural role and the content of the movie theater is changing. The revenue streams will never be the same as they were before. So we must place the correct piece of content where the exact right audience can find it. And we must also allure and educate the audience to want our content if our content is challenging. And that has always been the case, so that hasn't changed. And we must monetize the attention depending on where it is, not depending on like how the media industry worked 10, 15, 20 years ago. So we have to ask ourselves an existential questions. What is film and television in this landscape and how do we want this landscape to work? And right now, with the EU fighting back a little bit against the SVOD services and the US Senate fighting back a little bit against the tech companies and so on, it seems like there is a little um, space for negotiation. Like right now, everybody's kind of taking a deep breath and they're pushing back a little bit and saying, okay, but how do we actually want this to work? And nobody has any good answers. I'm sure that Film Politiska Topdagen, uh, well, no, I'm realistically going to predict that at Film Politiska Topdagen, we will not hear a clear vision for how we think that, that the audiovisual landscape will be shaped in Sweden in the next 10 years. I'm not even sure we will have a government in January. So there's also that. The good thing to remember is that there is a tension between broad audiences and artistic experimentation, but there is absolutely no conflict between quality and popularity. Uh, many of the big TV shows are of a very high quality and very complex, and the audience love them anyway. Much of the work that you do is of a very high quality and quite complex, and they do connect strongly with the audiences. And even experimental content, niche content, content in small languages, has a completely different global market now and local market, because we can individually advertise to the viewers who are interested in exactly the kind of thing that you are making. We can find them with these same digital tools, which is fantastic, but we can only find them if we know who they are. If you don't know who you're making this content for, what kinds of humans are, are, are going to love your thing, then you can't connect with them. But if you do, the technology exists to put your content in front of them. Uh, and also I think we can see that, that things that used to be impossible have already changed. Certainly like Norwegian and Finnish TV drama is now traveling the world. <laughs> that was not going to happen five years ago. I don't think I would have predicted that to be a thing. So, um, there is uh, a creative crisis in Hollywood a lot. Uh, of the biggest films that make the, reach the biggest audiences are, of course, quite good, and then they're making a lot that is terrible shit. Um, and they haven't, their business models are also breaking, so they can't support the mid-level, middle-brow movie, which is what Europeans make really well. So if we make an expensive, clever, but broad movie, it's exactly the kind of thing that used to come out of the mini-majors that, that right now, for some reason, the Americans are not doing very well. So we have real uh, possibilities here. Um, and, and I think it's good to just remember that if a film like, like uh, Emanson Heter Ove is the broadest comedy made in or broadest film made in Sweden one year, when it travels the world, it goes to art house cinemas and it's an intelligent niche film. Monsieur Ove, as you can see, even from the poster, this is a very different kind of of message, right? Um, but, but this stuff travels, but that means that I think within on the Nordic level, on the Swedish level, on the local level, we, can, we have to drop the distinctions between, oh, I'm an art house filmmaker, oh, I'm a commercial filmmaker, drop it, like stop. We can't be fighting each other about resources, like that's ridiculous. We have to be working towards the same goal. We have to think about who are the audiences? How do we train them to watch the content? And how do we make our, our content travel? I think that European blockbusters, in fact, is, has a real potential. We know that we can make films in, in Europe that look amazing and that can be funded entirely outside of the traditional channels. Of course, this movie was a piece of shit. Um, but that doesn't mean they have to be. We could dream much, much bigger than we're dreaming today. And in Europe, I would say we have all the talent ex except probably the script writers, because a lot of those American movies are made in Europe already by Europeans, or they're made in, in, in the US by our talent. They would work at home if they'd be given the chance.
And again, lack of money is not a problem. What if we make slightly fewer films and we make some of them bigger? That would solve a lot of our problems. This is my dream film. I don't know who owns the IP. If you do, don't tell me because I'm going to tell everybody. Um, yeah. The Americans and the Chinese will never be able to do this. Like They're never going to make the locally very specific content that could potentially travel a lot, like Scam or like Ronya. Uh, I think we should dream big, dream very big and focus very small. We're not going to compete on production value. Everything needs to be good, so ultimately we can't compete on quality because everything needs to be of high quality. The only thing we can compete on is relevance. Relevance, relevance, relevance. And that means that you have to have an audience focus. Um, that's the only way. We talk a lot about content strategy, like, oh, what kinds of films does the audience want? Mm, maybe we should talk a little bit less about ourselves and a little bit more about who, are the who is the audience, in fact. Like, who are these humans? What's happening in the world? Uh, what are people yearning for? Um, yes, and that is all I had to say. So I will just say one more thing uh, as a little footnote, that uh, VR uh, is really happening uh, now. So that's fun and cool. The technology has finally caught up with where the storytelling was like two years ago. And now that means that there's going to be a new burst where storytelling is going to solve the next level of problems and then the technology needs to catch up again. So it's a little bit wonky. The consumer market isn't there. So the business model problems haven't quite been solved, but it's happening. Uh, and because of gaming consoles, I think two, three years, then we're going to start to talk about VR being at least able to more or less make its money back uh, and uh, if you want to I have traveled the world to see VR and most of the selections are terrible but if you want to go to one place and actually see VR that is curated and quite good it's the Venice Film Festival where you need to go so that's just for your information there we are if we work according to the old logic we are fucked this is a thrilling moment of risk and opportunity um, I think all of these uh, these problems can be solved but you cannot wait you cannot wait for the public's funding to solve this. And I have had the pleasure to, of working with a lot of European film institutes and regional funding bodies. And they are just, it, it's going to take too long because most of them are controlled by laws. And if you have to change a law, you have to win an election and you have to, no, that's going to take too long. There's no magical public arts money that's going to come and solve this problem for you. You have to understand. You have to solve how to fund your content. And then if you can also get public money into the mix, excellent, I'm all for it, that's great. Of course, we need to protect that. But the business model problem is not going to be solved outside the industry, it's going to be solved inside the industry. And it means that you're going to have to experiment. I have great confidence in you. I think you're going to do great. We can do it. Thank you very much.